Hello and welcome to the Slow Tycoon Podcast. This conversation with Stephen Law was recorded on 18th of March 2021. He is a philosopher, author of several books and a former research fellow at the Queen's College, Oxford. He was a, reser- he was a reader at the Heathrow College, University of London and is currently the editor of the academic journal Think, Philosophy for Everyone, which is sponsored by the Royal Institute of Philosophy and published by the Cambridge University Press. Please enjoy the conversation. Um, so thank you, Dr. Law, for joining, for taking the time and joining me today in the podcast. It, it is a pleasure to have you here today. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, so the reason why I invited you here today in the podcast is to uh, like discuss the problem of evil and the evil God challenge, which you put forward. So could you very briefly introduce us to the problem of evil and then we could later move on for the evil God challenge? Sure. Okay. So you want me to talk about the problem of evil, just outline the yeah. problem. Yeah, okay. So yeah. um <clears throat> so um the problem of evil uh concerns two kinds of evil. Um there are moral evils and natural evils. So moral evils are the morally bad things that we do to each other for which we are morally responsible. And then natural evils are things like natural diseases, natural disasters that cause great suffering um you don't have to use the word evil that's it's kind of a tradition that it's referred to as the problem of evil but um some some people call it the problem of suffering uh instead um so the problem is this that um on the face of it there's a great deal of evil and um it's hard to see why god would allow it um So there are two versions of the problem. There's the logical problem, which says that if there's any evil at all, even a teaspoonful, uh, then there can't be a God. Uh, The existence of any evil at all um, logically entails that there's no God. Um, And that's because an all good God would not want there to be evil and an all knowing God would know about the evil if it existed and being all powerful, he could prevent the evil. So there just shouldn't be any evil at all. So if there is any evil, then there's no God. And clearly there is evil. So there's no God. That's called the logical problem. I don't think it's, a, it's, it's, it's not considered uh, the most serious problem of evil. Um, usually people point out that God might have good reasons to allow certain evils. If that's the price, he must inevitably pay for greater goods. So perhaps... Uh, it's really good that we have free will, that we can freely choose to do good or evil of our own, of our own volition. We're not just puppet beings. Um, so um, that's a good, but the downside is that sometimes we do evil. Um, but the good more than um, compensates for or outweighs the uh, the evil. So that's the logical problem, probably not a, much of a problem, theism. The the other problem is called the evidential problem, and you can present it in different ways. Um, My preference is to run the same problem, but just add a word. So it's the logical problem, but we just tweak it slightly. So the problem is this, that if there's an all-powerful, all-knowing and all-good God, then there shouldn't be any gratuitous evil. So I've added the word gratuitous now, and gratuitous means that the evil um, isn't justified from the perspective of an all-powerful, all-knowing and all-good God. There's no good reason to allow it, okay? So God may allow evils, if there's a good reason, some greater good can be achieved by allowing the evil, but he's not going to allow an evil otherwise, you know, a pointless or gratuitous evil. But there do appear to be, you know, look out the window, there's a great deal of evil out there, and much of it does appear to be gratuitous. It's hard to see what possible reason God could have for allowing um, a great deal of the evil that we see and so we conclude that there probably is no god there that if there's probably no good god justifying reason for these evils then there's probably no god um that's called the evidential problem of evil um and it, I, I think that's a that's a very significant problem for traditional theists and they've struggled with it and tried to deal with it in various ways one way is to try and think up the reasons that god might have for allowing the evils. Um, There are all sorts of suggestions that theists have come up with, that the evils are there for soul-making purposes, for example, 
or they're again they're a result of our being given free will um <clears throat> or sir so in this case the in the evidential problem of evil the quantity of evil is like relevant here right unlike the logical problem of evil yes that's right it's relevant um because the sheer scale and also the depth of the evil is such that it seems highly unlikely that God will have a good reason to allow every last ounce of it. Surely there's just too much um, for it all to be explained away in such a way. Uh, that just seems incredibly unlikely. Um, it does, And to me, it does seem very unlikely. I, I think that the sheer scale of evil, the depth of evil that we see in the world is such that that's pretty good evidence that there is no all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-good God. Now, you can get around the problem, of course, if you just um, cross off any one of the three omni-attributes. If you say that God is not omnipotent, all-powerful, well, um, no problem at all. You can just say, oh, he'd like to get rid of the evil. He knows about it. He just can't get um, Or if you cross off omnip um, omniscience, he doesn't, you know, then you can say, if he knew about the evil, he'd get rid of it. And he, he certainly would want to, but, you know, he doesn't know about it. So, uh, Or you can cross off the all-good attribute, omnibenevolence, um, and then, you know, God's not going to care <laughs> if there's some evil, uh, perhaps. Um, so it's not surprising that the evil exists. So you cross out any one of the three omni-attributes and you're out of the woods. But the problem for traditional theists is they want their God to be all-powerful, all-knowing and all-good. Uh, that's very important. Um, you know, you're, you're a heretic <laughs> if you start crossing any of those attributes off. So um, hence, it's it's a significant problem for a traditional theist. Monotheism, the classical monotheistic God. Yeah, exactly. Um, just, uh, just so that I think some of my audiences won't be like familiar with the theodicies involved in this case. So could you just very briefly run over the three main theodicies which we have? The, you, I think you discussed about it in your paper, the free will theodicies, the character building solution, and the second order good requiring first order evil. Just, could you just very briefly just introduce us yeah. to that as well? Well, there are many, many theodicies, all sorts of theodicies. Um, so one would be to, um, uh, again, appeal to free will, just like we did with the logical problem of evil. Um, you can try and explain some of the evil by saying that it's a result of our acting freely. God could have made it pup, pup, could have made us puppet beings that always did the benevolent thing. But if you're a puppet, you're not responsible for what you do. You're just a puppet. And if you're not responsible for what you do, the good that you do, well, you know, you're, you, you don't get the credit for that. Uh, it's not moral goodness so, you know, uh, that, that, that can be attributed to you. So in order for moral goodness to exist in the universe, um, God had to cut the strings, set us free. So now we are free to do good of our own free will. But the downside to that is that sometimes we choose not to do good. In fact, we choose to do evil. Unfortunate, but that's the price God pays. Um, so that's a free will theodicy or explanation for the evil. Um, there are obvious limitations to it um, it only explains the evils for which we are responsible and indeed there's a great deal of evil for the which, natural evil yeah the natural evils we don't appear to be responsible for earthquakes and tsunamis and so on or diseases and so a great deal of pain and suffering um, just appears still to be inexplicable we've only explained part of the evil um, but then you can introduce other uh, theodicies so um, you can say that this is a veil of soul making, a bit like the theologian John Hick. He suggests that we're in a kind of environment that gives us opportunities to um, become better people. Um, so we're given the opportunity to um, help each other, be charitable, but that requires that some people be in trouble, for example, and uh, require our help and so on. So. Um, Yes, there's pain and suffering, but it's there for a purpose. Uh, sometimes there's a kind of analogy used involving a, a young girl learning to ride her bike. Uh, a parent will watch their daughter try to ride the bike and fall off, and there will be pain and suffering as a result. But the parent will encourage the child to get back on 
despite knowing there will be more pain and suffering, because actually at the end of the day, the child learns to ride the bike and has the sense of achievement that you get from having been through this um, somewhat unpleasant process. So in the same way, then, God will encourage us to move through the pain and suffering that we experience in this life in order to become better people, have a sense of achievement, um, acquire uh, new virtues that would otherwise be unavailable to us. So there's that kind of theodicy. Um, Again, there are significant limitations to it on the face of it. Uh, Much of the pain and suffering that we experience doesn't seem to be character building at all. It seems to be character destroying. Um, You say, for example, you know, people will often bow out of this life psychologically and physically demolished by the pain and suffering through which God has put them. I mean, they're just happy to get out. Um, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to make sense of <laughs> their experiences in terms of this is character building. It clearly, clearly isn't building their characters. It's destroying their characters. Um, so, again, there are limitations. Um, and then there are many other theodicies um, that have uh, been constructed. You mentioned... Um, first order evils for second order goods. So um, you can have um, certain goods, um, charity, for example. Uh, It's important we be able to be charitable to each other, but in order for us to be charitable, um, some people need to be needy. So God had to make some needy people (laughs) in order for us to have the opportunity to be charitable. Um, So there's a first order um, evil, neediness, uh, that's required for the second order good of being charitable. Um, so, yeah, so those are the kinds of theodicy that are offered. Um, and then there's also another strategy called sceptical theism, which is currently quite fashionable, which involves not bothering with necessarily, I mean, you can give a theodicy if you like, but you don't have to provide a theodicy. Um, what you do instead is you say, well, Perhaps I can't think of a reason why God would allow all of this pain and suffering. But that doesn't mean that there isn't a reason. I mean, I'm a human being with limited abilities. It may be that there's a reason back there. And I just because I can't think of it doesn't mean it's not there. So I'm really not in a position to know that there are any gratuitous evils. I mean, I know there are evils, but how do I know they're gratuitous? I don't, because I'm in no position to know that there's no no, reason. Yeah. So that's called sceptical theism. That, that's another, that's a really nice get out of jail free card <laughs> that you can um, employ if you're a theist in order to try and deal with um, the evidential problem um, of evil. So, uh, but could it now introduce us to the evil God hypothesis and like how you build the evil God challenge and the reverse theodicies in play here? Could you just reverse those theodicies, the three theodicies you mentioned yeah. for us? Sure, okay. So the evil God challenge is it's just a way of presenting the problem of evil, but kind of with the twist added. Um, and the reason that I I think I think the reason, I think what I'm trying to do here primarily is get people to see that the moves that they're making, constructing these theodicies, playing the skeptical theism card, right, which they think are somehow dealing with the evidential problem of evil, at least to their satisfaction, right? bringing it down. Maybe it's a still a problem, but it's not the catastrophically bad problem that uh, it, it appeared to be. That exactly the same strategies can be employed in defence of another God belief, which they, when they when they look over there and see those strategies being employed over there, they realise that they're completely ludicrous and they don't do the job at all. Um, so it's a kind of an analogy which is designed to get people to um, have a, just have a, a um, it's sometimes called breaking the spell, right? People hypnotise themselves into thinking that they've dealt with the problem. There's a kind of spell, um, and sometimes you just need to break the spell by getting them to um, see things from a different angle. And that's really what the um, the evil God challenge does. So what I do is I get people to consider a different God hypothesis, um, that there's an all-powerful God that's all-knowing and is all-evil, 
omni-malevolent, omni-benevolent, right? They're just the one God, no good God, just the evil God, who's not the devil, by the way, because the devil isn't even a God. Um, uh, is, there, is that our creator? Is that the being in charge of the universe? Um, almost everyone considers that belief absurd and dismisses it out of hand. Um, why? Well, again, in my experience, the first thought that people have is, but, you know, there's too much good. <laughs> the, the world is filled with love and laughter and ice cream and rainbows and puppies. And, you know, so the, an evil God wouldn't create a world like that with that much goodness in it. Um, maybe some good, maybe an evil God would allow some good, but he's not going to allow that much. The, the existence of good on such a scale and such to such a depth is clearly good evidence against an evil God. And of course, most people can see that that's true. <laughs> Actually, uh, it is absurd to believe in an evil God. Uh, there is abundant evidence against the existence of an evil God. But you can defend uh, belief in an evil God by constructing theodicies and applying sceptical theism. So here's an example, uh, the free will theodicy. Right? Let's turn that around. Um, somebody might object to belief in an evil God on the grounds that an evil God wouldn't... Um, wouldn't allow people to do good and help each other they would an evil god would prevent that kind of behavior um actually that's not true an evil god will give us free will why because he will want us to freely choose to do evil because otherwise if we're just puppet beings and he just makes us do evil stuff we're not responsible for it we, we don't get the blame for it there's no moral evil in the universe now for any point of view of an evil god it's important that the universe contain moral evil he will cut the strings, set us free. And that means that some people choose to do good of their own volition. An evil God hates that, but it's the price he has to pay for a moral evil existing in the universe. So you can see what I've done there is I've just taken the standard religious free will theodicy and I've just employed it in defense of belief in an evil God. Um, and once you've seen you can do that with one of these theodicies, you realize you can do it with, if not all of them, certainly most of them. Um, so, you know, the idea that this is a veil of soul making, you can twist that round and say, no, this is a veil of, of soul breaking. Oh, that's right. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, we're given some good things. We're given a lovely view, right? We're given ice cream. Uh, but there's an evil reason for all of these goods. Um, uh, yeah, we, we're given ice cream, which is lovely, but it makes us fat. And then we feel really bad about the, you know, we've succumbed to temptation. So, um uh, and yeah, okay, we get a lovely view, but that just reminds us how bleak and ugly most of day-to-day -day life and reality really is. For example, yes, God gives us children to love. Uh, why would an evil God do that? Well, because he then kills them on an industrial scale over the last 200,000 years. The pain and the suffering is beyond our comprehension and so on. So you can use soul-breaking theodicies to defend belief in a evil God, and they look pretty pretty much as convincing as the soul making theodicies so the theodicies seem to work pretty well on both sides but if you don't if you think they're not good enough just as we employed skeptical theism to defend belief in a uh, good god you can employ it to believe defend belief in bad god you say there is some reason some evil reason for the goods that we see just because i can't think of the reason doesn't mean that the reason's not there so you know all of these goods uh, none of them are gratuitous goods. There's a good evil reason for every last one of them, and you're in no position to say that any of these goods are gratuitous, so you can't run your evidential problem of good. So you can see that now we appear to be in a sort of symmetrical situation currently. By look, looking at just the, the, the stuff that we've looked at thus far, theodicies and so on, um, we seem to have two God hypotheses. There's evidence against them, but then that evidence can be dealt with using theodicies and sceptical theism. And if we also look at the evidence for these gods, uh, it also seems to be pretty balanced. Um, most of the, if you ask people why they believe in God, they'll typically say, well, why is there something rather than nothing? Uh, they'll give you some sort of cosmological argument. But actually those cosmological arguments don't establish that God is good. They just establish that there is some kind of creator or first cause or prime mover. So it could be an evil God. No reason yet to say that it isn't. So that argument doesn't favour the good God over the evil God. 
Um, uh, similarly, design arguments. You know, why why does the, the universe just right for life? Why does it have that Goldilocks property? Or where did the eyeball come from? Surely it couldn't just have evolved, could it? There must be some kind of designer back there. Well, maybe there is a designer, but why does it have to be all good? Uh, it doesn't. It could be evil. Maybe the maybe maybe evil God created eyeballs so that tiny parasitic worms could drill into them uh, in, in, in blind children, which is exactly what happens. Right. So um, these arguments for God don't seem to favour the good God over the evil God either. Uh, well, there are one or two exceptions, but for the most part, the ones that people tend to put seem to put most weight on. They're leaving the two God hypotheses evenly balanced again. And so if you think that belief in an evil God is absurd, and surely it is, all right, we all know it's absurd. <laughs> you, you, you have to be slightly bonkers, surely, to think that there really is a supremely evil creator of the universe. The question now is, why is belief in a good God any less bonkers than that? And at this point, we don't seem to have a good argument. Um, it, it seems that if we're going to have, if we if we want to say, as surely we must, that belief in an evil god is absurd, we're going to have to say the same thing about a good god, which is exactly how it strikes very many of us, me included. It just seems to me absurd <laughs> to think that the entire universe is the creation of a I mean, supremely powerful and benevolent creator. I think when uh, I first read about it, it was, sorry, it was absurd to me as well. When I when I first read about it, the evil god challenge, it was it's um, it felt absurd to me as well because. Primarily, we don't think like that in with our reasoning. I mean, yeah. it sort of it was like it was very quirky to me at first glance. So, and I so, and I, that's why I brought you here to discuss it. I mean, it's a really interesting idea, to be very honest, that to reverse the theodicies in the other way around. Yeah, good. It's just designed to get people to. Like I say, to break the spell, because people often think that they've dealt with the, to, at least to, to some extent, dealt with the eventual problem of evil by coming up with their theodicies and playing the sceptical theism card. And yet when they look over there at the evil God hypothesis and the way that's being defended using the, the exact same theodicies and the sceptic, they go, no, that's ridiculous. Only a madman would, would defend that belief in that way and think that that was reasonable. But now they're in trouble <laughs> because that's exactly the strategy that they've been employing. So it kind of breaks the spell and makes them realise that what they've been doing is not nearly as reasonable as they've somehow managed to convince themselves uh, that it is. Um, that's really the, the, the point of the challenge is to, just to get people to stop and think for a moment and just try to explain to themselves. Perhaps they can do it, but explain to themselves why their good God belief is so much more reasonable. Than belief in an evil god. I mean, even if you don't think that belief in a good god is proved, you know, right up the top of the scale of reasonableness, most believers think that it's, you know, halfway up the scale. You know, it's not an, un it's not like believing in fairies or Santa, right? Much more reasonable than that. Uh, whereas belief in an evil god is right down here. Okay, now they, they got some explaining to do then. If you believe that uh, uh, belief in a good god is not unreasonable, whereas belief in an evil god is just absurd, well, why? Why this dramatic difference in how reasonable the two beliefs are? Please explain. Um, I don't, I'm not sure that there is a good explanation. And that's, that's one of the reasons why I'm an atheist. Oh. So, um, sir, so you have always shown a very keen interest in the philosophy of both science and religion and have been in conversation with Professor Richard Dawkins himself. So how do you think that bo both the fields, religion and science, should interact with each other moving into the future? Well, uh, so obviously I'm not religious because I'm an atheist. Um, um, uh, I don't, I mean, I don't, I have lots of religious friends. Um, I get on very well with them. We have conversations about religion and science and so on. Um, um, so, you know, it's not that I'm, I, 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 I worry about religion a little bit. Um, it seems to me that it is an extraordinarily powerful thing, like most supernatural beliefs. And also some other extraordinary beliefs, like conspiracy theories, for example. Um, when people get sucked into these systems of belief, 
um, often they're quite harmless, right? They don't really do very much harm. But when they go wrong, they can go really wrong. <laughs> uh, religions can explode into all sorts of horrific um, scenarios where you have persecution and invasion and wars and so and and it's a it's a sign of just how powerful these belief systems are that, that, that they can get smart college educated people to believe completely ludicrous things so in america polls indicate around about 45 percent of americans believe the entire universe is less than 10,000 years old the entire universe and they think that's good science as well. 45% of Americans, apparently. Now, that's, it really takes a powerful <laughs> kind of d- delusional force to get so many people to believe something that absurd. Um, and religion can do that. Um, and so given that potency, I'm always a little bit nervous. <laughs> Uh, around religions just because I know that although they're probably you know for the most part fairly benign and they they can often do a lot of good I'm, I don't want to deny that um there's a, there's always a risk associated with religion um and I don't think that they're true I, I don't think that any religion is true so you know I, given that I would prefer people to believe what's true I would prefer prefer it if people didn't weren't religious um but only for that for that reason um, so when it comes to science, I, I think people often think that science can't touch religion. Even some scientists have said that. Um, Stephen Jay Gould, for example, famous scientist who insisted Non-overlapping that, magisteria. Yeah, non-overlapping magisteria. So you've got religion over here, science over here, and they only have their own separate domains. And religion talks about the rock of ages and science talks about the age of rocks, <laughs> but they can't. You can't have religion talking about the age of rocks. I mean, but that's the, but the things go wrong when they each try and invade each other's territory. They are non-overlapping magisteria. Um, so plenty of people believe that, religious people and non-religious people. Um, I don't believe that. Mind you, actually, plenty of religious people don't believe that. Uh, the Catholic Church doesn't believe it because the Catholic Church thinks that miracles occur and they can be authenticated by scientifically qualified people and they have teams of scientifically authentic, uh, qualified people to authenticate the miracles in order to canonize people in order to make a saint they you have to pray and it, to the saint potential saint and there have to be two authenticated miracles okay in order to, before that person can become canonized so they were looking for this the miracles that mother Teresa had done yes. for example and they were they were they were authenticated so she, you know she can become a saint if, if, if they're authenticated um so apparently science can <laughs> investigate um and in fact the the there's an organization called the templeton foundation uh, which funds a lot of research into science and religion that funded research into the power of prayer if you pray for people some people think that that can um help with the medical condition of a patient like a heart patient so templeton set up a proper control study where people were assigned into two groups randomized um it was you know anonymized no one knew who's in which group double blind they didn't know the people performing the experiment didn't know and then one group got prayed for and the other group did not they wanted to see did the prayer have any effects medical effects on the heart patients and they found that it did not uh and that kind of experiment has now been done several times over these experiments are often being done by people who actually believe that prayer works but they can't get the evidence and this is not just an absence of evidence that prayer works it's evidence of absence it's evidence that prayer does not work so we have scientifically investigated prayer and that there's pretty good evidence it doesn't work certainly not in that light making heart patients get better so it seems to me that science can touch religious claims religious beliefs even religious people think it can the, the, the t- when they bring the shutters down and say no you can't touch my religious beliefs with your science is when they think that um science is a threat to religious belief and sometimes it is it was in the t- case of that templeton study 
people often think that religion can't be touched by science because religion concerns the unobservable, right? There's a kind of a veil between the natural observable world and the supernatural unobserved world. And one or two of us can glimpse through the veil, uh, maybe the power of prayer or religious experience, and we can dimly see what's behind. But science is firmly trapped on this side of the veil and cannot ever investigate what's unobserved. Uh, and so they try and protect their religious beliefs in that way. But it's not true that um, science can't touch the unobserved. Science um, deals with the unobserved all the time. So subatomic particles, necessarily unobservable. You can have good scientific evidence for or against their existence. Um, the distant past of this planet, unobservable by us. But, you know, we've got ample evidence that dinosaurs once roamed the Earth, for example, despite the fact that no one has ever seen one doing it. Um, so, yeah, the unobserved is not off limits to science. All that's required is that there be scientifically or empirically, observationally available evidence that might count for or against it. Um, you get that with subatomic particles and with the distant past of this planet, and you can get that with gods. So, you know, if there's an all-powerful, all-good god, you'd expect this side of the veil to be a bit nicer <laughs> than it actually is. Uh, if there's an all-powerful, all-evil god behind the veil, you'd expect what's on this side of the veil to be pretty, pretty unpleasant, much more unpleasant than it actually is, something much more like a sort of hellscape. Uh, but, you no, know, there's love and laughter and ice cream and rainbows in abundance. So whilst there is some evil, there's too much good on this side, and that counts against there being an evil god on the other behind the veil. So it seems to me that science can touch religious beliefs. Um, the only time it can't really is when your religious belief is just so completely amorphous. <laughs> There's not really any substance to it. It's just, I just believe in something and it's beyond. Like Bertrand Russell, I'm talking about that certain things that you say that you it can't be proved by the methods of science. So those types of claims, I guess you're talking about. Yeah, Russell famously said, you know, that, that this is something that we can't verify or disprove. Um, but I think you can disprove many religious hypotheses and God claims. Yeah. Um, so thank you so very much, uh, Mr. Dr. Stephen Law, for joining with us today. It has been a real pleasure to have you here. Today. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Um, thank you very much. Sorry my phone went off at the last minute. I thought I turned it off, but apparently I hadn't. Um, yeah, no, it's a pleasure. Thank you. And... Good luck with your podcasting. It was, it was, uh, Thank you so very much. Very enjoyable. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Slow Tycoon Podcast. If you liked this episode, please don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you so very much for joining.